Jim, um, I, I know I mentioned it in the last episode of Continuing Conversations, uh, but today we're going to start out uh, talking about what I think is one of the hottest trilogies out there right now. It's Star Trek Coda. Before uh-huh. we go in that, though, for people who are just joining us in this show, we want to introduce and invite you to Continuing Conversations. It's a podcast about Star Trek Adventures RPG. And the purpose of this podcast it's talk about everything Star Trek Adventures. It includes latest releases, professionals, fans, game rules, mechanics, how to be a better GM, how to be a better player, discussing the wider Star Trek universe in relation to STA, which is why I mentioned Star Trek Coda today, answering your questions about the best RPG ever. I'm Michael Dismuke, freelance writer for the Star Trek Adventures uh, RPG. I'm a contributor to Continuing Missions, the number one fan site for the Star Trek Adventures game and your average geek. And today we are here with the very friendly, very well-connected Jim Johnson. He's a writer, gamer, Star Trek Adventures project manager, popcorn lover, daddy, and cat minion. All right, Jim, where are you at with, with the Coda Trilogy? Uh, I have to admit that I'm a, I'm a little jealous of you that you're already uh, in, either into book two or almost done with book two, if you're, if you're definitely done. not mistaken. But I am I am like 70% of the way through book one, and I'm just I'm, I'm chugging my way through it. And I just haven't had the time in the last week or so to finish it because, like, I, I've got book two. I, I pre-ordered all three of them. And mm-hmm. so book two is on my Kindle, ready to go. And uh, I've just got to finish book one first, obviously. And I, uh, just I, super I, excited. Yeah, I've been blessed to have to drive a lot in the car recently, so I yeah. I, I wisely had ordered the audibles, and so I've okay. been listening to them. So for those of you who don't know, it's a trilogy. Uh, the first one is Moments Asunder by Dayton Ward. If you don't know him, New York Times bestseller, he's been writing for 20 years. Ashes of Tomorrow, James Swallow, another well-known Trek writer, and Oblivion's Gate by David Mack, okay? Writer not only of Star Trek, but all kinds of other cool IPs. Mm-hmm. Um what does this have to do with Star Trek RPG? Uh, many people might be wondering. Well, one of the reasons we're highlighting our podcast is the Game Master's Guide and the Player's Guide is because we understand that a lot of people are hesitant to get into the game because of so much canon. Mm-hmm. The novels are 20 years of, of, of um, story and Star Trek and background on characters that continue after the TV show. And for me, I remember how intimidated I was to get into the novels because of that fact, because I started about five years ago on the novels, if you can believe that. Mm -hmm. Um, With that said, what I learned and what I like about these trilogies, it's kind of putting the bow on the last 20 years. It's wrapping that up. And my heart is breaking and I'm choking up reading the second book (laughs) Um, (laughs) because of the stories in there. Um, as As an RPG player, I'm, of course, trying to figure out how do I take the best of that and convert it into the game. And Star Trek Adventures RPG gives you the license to do that, um, which is really cool. What's your take on that, uh, Jim? How do you pull in the best stories? Or if you see something cool in a novel, what's your take on bringing that into your RPG game? What advice do you have for people? Do it. I mean, if you see something cool in a book or a novel or a, or a you know a nonfiction resource for Star Trek, anything... I mean, fill your, fill, I would tell this to writers of any kind of fiction, just fill your brain with ideas and read everything and, and just, you know, cherry pick the stuff that looks cool and fit it into your game somewhere. Uh, like you said, there is like, like the last 20 years of Star Trek novels are fairly well interwoven, you know, beta canon wise, but there's another 20 years of novels before that, that were just like standalones, right? They, because they, you know, they had the original series and next gen and TNG and DS9 and all these other novels that uh, most, for the most part, weren't connected to each other, but they were just, you know, part of the series uh, and tied into the series. And then it was like somewhere in the late, I know it must have been the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. They they really started to make more of an effort to tie all the new different novel series together and have kind of like a, a you know continuing through lines happening, and and that's just a uh, um, a wealth of potential information to drop into your into your games. Like the novels have been consistently, you know, if not great, good for for so long now that like like 
a, a lot, there's a whole generation of Star Trek fans right now that know the novels really, really well and can pull all that content into their games if they want to. Uh, to, to some, I mean, even to some extent, I think I think the producers of Discovery have cherry picked certain elements out of the novels, which doesn't surprise me, of course, because Kirsten Beyer is uh, is one of the producers of Discovery, and she wrote a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of novels. novels. Yeah, yeah. Boy, and to that point, this is this is why I wanted to talk about that. When you say that, Jim, I think the average person who maybe wants to get into Star Trek RPG for the first time may yeah. feel a little intimidated. And I want to tell them, don't, because your story is your story. You're creating yeah. the best story for your group. And if you come across a conflict in a comic, in a movie, in a TV show, or reading the novels, don't mm-hmm. worry about it. Your game is your game and, and yeah. just take the best of the best. I really wish I could give spoilers about the books, but I hate spoilers. I, I'm the kind <laughs> of just, I don't watch trailers for movies yeah. um, because of that. So once it's all out and it's in, out there in the ether a little bit more, then I ha- I'm dying to talk about some of the highlights of the books. But my my the reason I brought this up for today's show is because we're talking about eras of play and styles of play mm-hmm. with Star Trek. It's the GM chapter three. And um, I think it's relevant that I brought in that whole canon and beta canon conversation, because when you're building your world, these are the things you get to consider, you and your players, about what does your world look like? What did you pull from all these different elements, right? Yep. Yep, absolutely. All right, cool. So again, that's why the chapter is important. This is chapter three of the Game Master's Guide that we're going over today. And we're going to go over the two sections, which is eras of play, styles of play, why these are important. So let's go ahead and start with eras of play. Uh, Love this chapter as a primer for the players. Talk talk to us, Jim, about what it does. Yeah, for sure. So first, I, I want to just say that this is one of this is the last chapter in both books that are that covers kind of the same ground right so like chapter one chapter two and chapter three of both the player's guide and the game master's guide cover the same topics even though they're from two different directions right so the, obviously the player's guide is focused on the players and like what you can do with that information from a player perspective and then the game master guide takes the same headings you know the same con the con same basic content but orients it entirely toward the game master right and so with the errors of play chapter what i wanted to do is is like if you look at star trek as a franchise like on, on film anyway it covers about you know a thousand years right give or take uh from like 2063 all the way to the 3100s in in discovery season three and season four and so we took that uh, i took that massive you know chunk of time where it's likely the vast majority of star trek adventures campaigns are probably going to be set uh just because that's what we know right that's what we see on screen that's what we're familiar with um uh although i'm sure there'll be a group that will prove me wrong and what i did is i i took that thousand odd years and I chunked it out into six really broad eras of play, right? Kind of like based around series to some extent, based around key events, et cetera. And then we take each of those six big eras of play and then just give you a ton of information about what's happening in that era, who are your likely antagonists, what's happening with the Federation. And uh, just to give players and game masters an opportunity to look at this enormous timeline of Star Trek stuff and say, where do we want to play our game? Because where where you pick in the timeline is going to impact how your characters think and how you, what your values are and and it'll impact what the game master can throw at you generally speaking right like uh i mean of course you can go yeah. off the rails if you want to but like we're trying to set a baseline here right and let's do that let's let's give them a highlight again we're not going to read the whole book to you but if yeah. you are listening to this or watching this we want to let you know about the the errors that you can choose if you want a lot of good canon material stuff on TV to watch to back it up and give you a feel. Again, as Jim said, you can squeeze your timeline before in between these eras or after these eras. Um, So let's start with the foundational years. This would be 2063 through 2199. I love one of the subheadings. It's been a long road. (laughs) Anyone who knows uh, knows why yeah. that song gets to that era. So, Jim, what era do, do is covered during the uh, foundational years? What TV shows, I should say, cover that? Yeah, I mean, the the, pri- the primary one is Enterprise. Uh, you got a little bit of Star Trek First Contact, you know, because you get to meet Zephram Cochran. Uh, it, it gets the whole ball rolling, right? He launches the Phoenix. The Vulcans check him out. They come do First Contact. 
and then it, it's it's uh, it's off to the races from there. The, the Vulcans get involved with the with uh, with Earth, and then you get all of Enterprise. And uh, this is like the found, and, and then you know Enterprise goes off and does their thing in uh, Star Trek Enterprise with Captain Archer. They meet the Andorians, they meet the Tellarites, they meet the Zindi. All this stuff happens. Glad you mentioned that. Well, yeah, I know yeah. one of the first freelance projects you gave me was to cover the Enterprise era and why yeah. I was thrilled with that. Some people, um, newbies coming to watch the show, don't really like Enterprise. And I tell them, sit and get through to seasons three and season four, because I yeah. fell in love with Andorians in this show. This was the show of all about Andorians to me. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to play the raw Andorians, you want to play the raw Tellarites, or if you want to play telepathic Anir, which is a subset of, yeah. of the Andorians, this could be the time for you. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree, yeah, and especially because and I'm, this is one of the things I'm really excited about is we know that there's going to be a, a Anir or Anar, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, on Strange New Worlds. Coming I didn't know that. Spoiler! Year. Oh, shoot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I don't like spoilers. I don't watch Oh, uh, shoot, I'm sorry, Michael. Uh, well, just erase that part of your brain. So Now uh, you yeah. messed me up because now I'm wondering, how is that possible? There was only like a thousand left according to right. uh, D, uh, D. Candido's books. And man, you met D, no, yeah. uh, Chris, well, let, let me let me switch. Let me let me move on, and I'll just and we can forget about it. Um, uh, I really like. I, I really like. Well, let me rephrase. I struggled with Enterprise initially. It took me a couple seasons to get into it, and then season three and season four were really good. Um, but even beyond the quality of the series, which was hit or miss, honestly, in my opinion, um, what I love the most about Enterprise is I think it's one of the. I think it's just about the most gameable era in star trek for a group because like literally if you look think about the enterprise nx01 it was out there on its own every week doing right. things that nobody no human crew had done before mm -hmm. and and i love the idea i mean even more than the original series it was pushing the envelope every episode and and it was like that was just like it's so everything was so new and different and like what a great opportunity for a role-playing group to go out there and do absolutely new stuff every every session. Well, I want to add too, it makes for a great vigilante game because before yeah. Enterprise NX-01 even launched, remember there was already boomers out there. There were yep. people already exploring and trading and setting yep. up colonies. Yep. So if you really want to be free of the Federation, completely free of, free of all that, yeah. go ahead and become a boomer, watch Enterprise. There's some background mm -hmm. about what boomers are, Google it. Um, and, and this would be the era to really be free of the Federation. So yeah. good point. All right, we move now on to Federation and Empire. The years are, the range is 2200 to 2299. What TV shows and movies are going to educate me about that time period? Yeah, so this is, uh, if you're looking at the timeline, this is the original series, the animated series, the first two, first two seasons of Discovery, and then all the uh, all the motion pictures, all, all the original series motion pictures, Star Trek One through Star Trek Six, and then the first chunk of Star Trek Generations where you got Kirk and Scotty and uh, and Chekhov on the Enterprise B, that, that little 20 minute opening segment bit. Um, this is just, you know, this is where it all started really with the, the original series. Um, How would you is, sum up the difference between Enterprise era, which we just talked about, and this era? What do you think is the general different feel for players and game masters if you were to explain it to them? Yeah, I think the general vibe would be that the Federation has kind of like established itself. It's formed. It's it's worked out the growing pains. It's now expanding. It's now becoming, uh, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, it, it's becoming the colonizers, right? They're out there gathering new worlds, you know, collecting colonies. They're adding new members. They're, they're butting heads with the Klingon Empire, which is out there doing the exact same thing. Uh, the Romulans are kind of the mysterious folks behind the behind the neutral zone getting involved, but it's primarily the Klingons and the Romulans. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm sorry, the Klingons and the Federation. I mean, this is classic uh, 60s Cold War here, right? It's the, it's the exactly. Soviet I'm Union. Glad you mentioned that. Exactly. Yeah, it's the Soviet Union and the United States. You know, they're both expanding rapidly, trying to gather up all the resources and uh, butting heads every chance they get. Yeah, if anybody really wants to sum up and understand the Cold War reference to um, not only can you watch the older episodes and any episodes that involve Kirk's crew versus Klingons, but Star Trek, the undiscovered country, one of my favorite movies of all time, go yeah. into it realizing it's about America and Russia and the dropping of the Cold Wall. And then you'll be like, whoa, I didn't realize 
that's what the 60s Star Trek was about. And it was. And another thing I like about this era, too, that many people miss out on because you have to tolerate. I personally like the animation, but some people don't want to tolerate 1960s, 1970s animation is the animated series has mm-hmm. a bunch of characters that were never on the original series because yep. they didn't have the makeup and costume for that. But I always wonder what happened to those characters. So I love as a player, if you like the animated series, pick up those characters. I just had Walking Bear and Imres in my in my most <laughs> recent game. And the, the players loved it because I'm like, man, we didn't see that much of them. So that's yeah. a great era you could explore. Um, and IDW Publishing, of course, has the comic book about year five. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Star Trek Two, which we that Modiphius just came out with a new book about, um, so you could play that era with this too, right? This yep. that era, yeah, yep. a lot of good stuff. Very popular era, but we, I would have to say, the most popular era. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right now would be um, the Allies and Adversaries era of 2300 to 2379. What TV shows are that, and what's going on in the universe at that time? Yeah, and that's uh, that's uh, you know that's uh, uh, next gen DS9 and Voyager and all the next gen era movies. Uh, this is this is the the one section of the Star Trek franchise. If you're looking at filmed you know film stuff that has just the most material. There's there's what seven fourteen. There's twenty one seasons plus movies worth of stuff in this era, and there's just so much material. I mean that's why we that's why we set the default setting for the game in twenty three seventy one because there's just so much happening between DS9 and Next Gen and, and Voyager, uh, you know, disappearing and going off to the Delta Quadrant. There's just so much story here that we, could, we, we, we couldn't ignore it, you know? <laughs> right. yeah, uh, because that's, that's where so many people have grown up. I mean, I, I grew up on, I, well, I grew up on reruns of the original series, but like I was, I was just starting college when uh, Next Gen came out. And then I was, you know, growing up and becoming, uh, you know, who I am. And, and like DS9 was a huge influence on that. Because DS9 really showed me that you can do something different with the Star Trek universe and still have it be Star Trek and relevant. Uh, so at, at this chat, this section of the chapter is really hitting on everything that happens from the beginning of Next Gen all the way to the end of Nemesis. Yeah, I think I have to always tell my story. You know, uh, I grew up watching reruns like you because my dad's a diehard yeah. TOS fan, and I grew up watching the animated series on repeats, but. I still remember the night me and my dad stayed home to watch the premiere on UPN of of, uh, The Next Generation. And the part that got me was my dad's reaction. Like, we're back, and he thought it was so awesome. But what I remember about it is after the opening, during the opening credits, when, you know, the, the rumbling starts because the Enterprise goes underneath, comes up from underneath, and my dad saw that people were walking in the in the windows he yeah. lost it he just lost it and i just i'll never forget that feeling of this is new this is fresh and it was just so classy at the time like yeah. starfleet had matured it was a clean cut good organization it wasn't rough and tumble like kirk these were the polish the best of the best so if that's what you want to play is just mankind at its best i really feel that it's time it's this time period don't you think so yeah, and I think you have to, I, I, in that respect, like at this point, like the Federation is so established and, and so there's so many, there's like 150 member worlds or whatever. But like, if you think of like, you know, Patrick Stewart playing Picard as like, he's like the embodiment of everything that you want a Starfleet captain to be uh, very measured, very, you know, diplomatic. You know, he, he's got the very uh, homogenous crew working together, solving problems together. And it's just like, that's like, that's just classic. Uh, I mean, not classic Trek, but it's just like the, the archetypes right there for you. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll go to go with that. Remember, you know, uh, Jean, uh, excuse me, Patrick Stewart is a Shakespearean level actor. Sure. Likewise, Kate Mulgrew, um, um, the actors of this time were coming off of stage and coming into Star Trek and they yep. brought this uh, decorum with them that, reflects this era it's not like mm-hmm. kirk getting into brawls and kind of yeah. drinking whiskey on the deck on deck and stuff like that this was a whole different type and i tell my nieces and nephews when they're watching it i said first of all forget that it's a tv show and view it as a stage play because they love stage mm-hmm. plays hamilton's mm-hmm. brought stage plays back for this generation i'm like look at it like a stage play and you won't expect all the flash you'll watch yeah. the story and that's what gets them into these so so that's your favorite era which is my favorite area 
era, then this would be the section. All right. But then, of course, as humans tend to do, things start breaking apart. So we move on. <laughs> we move on into post-war and reconstruction, 2380 to 2399. Talk to us about the shows and what the feel is of this generation. Yeah. And so for the longest time, this this era, like, like post-nemesis, there was really nothing um, other than the novels, right? The novels eventually went into 2380 and beyond. And so you could use the novels as kind of a basis for like what was happening. But uh, once Picard came out, Picard was set in 2399. And finally, we got some sort of story that took place after Nemesis, like what happens next? And they, you know, they jumped it ahead 20 years, but, uh, um, but now Lower Decks is out and now Lower Decks is starting to kind of like fill in that space as well. Although so far, you know, like I, I, we just finished watching season two of Lower Decks. They're not really carrying the like the geopolitical feel like like next gen and DS9 really, you know, especially DS9, right? Of course, with the Dominion War um, really changed the political landscape of the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. And we've never really seen the fallout of that. Um, but so what Lower Decks is showing us is that there doesn't seem to have been much of a fallout. Everything kind of went back to normal because we haven't seen the Romulans yet. Uh, we've kind of seen the Kling like they kind of hinted at something going on here with the Klingons and the Packleds at the end of season two. You know, no spoilers or anything, but uh, I'm curious to see where they go with that in season three. Yeah, um, they might keep it lighthearted. They might. They yeah, really, really. And you mentioned Lower Decks and Picard. They're on two ends of the spectrum. Where one's yeah, are they? <laughs> yeah, one's very lighthearted. And the other one, Picard, is really, you're starting to see what's happening. In, uh, Star Trek has always reflected what's going on in society. Mm -hmm. And in Picard, you're starting to see the skepticism and cynicism about organized structure and yep. what the Federation is about and how slow it takes bureaucracy to move to do good. And yep. so people taking vigilante and rogue. This is now my second favorite time period in Star Trek. I'm really enjoying mm -hmm. 2399 about what it's going to be. So if you are looking for more um, anti-establishment, type of gaming this might be the era for you and your team right yeah yeah you know and i'd also add that uh you know star trek picard um is uh is kind of a first for star trek and then in that it, it's telling like there's a lot of stuff going on but at its heart is a very very personal story and i think as a game master and as a player like getting back to the role-playing game this is an opportunity for you to do a different kind of storytelling in the star trek setting that isn't necessarily, you know, going off and exploring strange new worlds and, and and having adventures and stuff. You could have, you could like, if you got a good, strong, mature group of players, and you want to tell some really hard, you know, stuff. The, the, Picard is a good model for that because you're taking a character that's beloved and has been around for thirty odd years, and you're kind of deconstructing him, literally and figuratively. And and like as a gamer, I, I would. I, I'd be scared, but I would love to do something like that as a player. Like as a game master, it'd be really hard. I would need the right group of players to want to do that and explore it with. But like that could be like a goldmine of our of RP opportunity to well, do to something your, like that. Well, to your point, let me just give an example for new game masters, people who are maybe familiar with Star Trek, um, Voyager or TNG, DS9, and are coming into the game. A good launch if you kind of, I don't want to get muddled up in the Federation and the politics, but I want to play the game. You could pick up one of my favorite episodes from Voyager season one about the Sakarians. The Sakarians yeah. had this amazing transporter technology. They they would not give it to um, uh, Janeway and her crew on, on Voyager. That The show moves on from them. And you don't hear about them again until 2399 when you find out the Borg assimilated some of their technology. So that world fail to the board yeah. but it's never been seen on tv maybe you want to make your uh people a bunch of rogue sicarians the last survivors of of uh the delta quadrant as a story so you could use right. this time period to say whatever happened to where are they now this would mm -hmm. be a great setting for where are they now stories yeah absolutely yeah. Cool. All right. Then we move to this weird, obscure time period, which, of course, time travel always is. It's the temporal Cold War that lands somewhere within the 27th century and other time frames. Where did where did we pull this era from? Yeah, and this one's a little tricky because uh, you, you would kind of have to read some of the novels and you'd have to watch Star Trek Enterprise and, and like fairly carefully, you know, tease out the references that they make to the temporal, the temporal Cold War, because like it, it's certainly a factor with Archer and the 
and the you know future guy uh, or future person, whatever. Uh, so like the, there was clearly in the 27th century a a, a time war that involved you know, people going back in time to try to change things and people going forward in time and people trying to like police that and like try to keep people from changing all the divergent timelines that are out there. Um, so there is some information in the book. Uh, there's not really a huge amount of canon information about this. I know they touch on it in uh, the Coda books, uh, right? Like it's, uh, the first book, especially, there's a lot of stuff with- uh, I was about to say, if you want to know yeah. why you needed the temporal accords, I feel like- <laughs> I feel like that's what Coda is about is why you need the temporal accords. And I'm loving, uh, loving interesting. it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. To that point too, this is the opera. This is, if you're going to play in the temporal cold war, you're not restricted to the 25th, 7th century. You could be on a specialized Federation ship traveling to Renaissance times in or order any, to anywhere, capture, yeah. capture aliens who are trying to manipulate humanity thousands of years ago or anywhere. So this is yeah. to me the biggest free form part um, if you want people who, if you have a bunch of gamers and players who are like, ah, we just want to have this type of game. Okay, you know what? Then we're mm -hmm. going to say you're something to do with temporal investigations or something, right? Yeah. Cool. And, you know, not to not to cross the streams necessarily here, but, like, if anybody's out there has seen Loki, the, you know, the TV series Loki, you know, and, <clears throat> and you want to play, like, a, a, a Department of Temporal Investigations or, uh, you know, the, the um, what was it, the, the TVA, right, in Loki. Yeah. If you want to play like a like a like a federation agent who's responsible for keeping the timeline intact this is a great time to do it right because you just yeah. take your device and you go you go troubleshoot um time disturbances and like you can berate kirk or you can berate picard or like whoever's screwing up the timeline go back in time and you know fix it and then go back to your desk job and file the paperwork <laughs> yeah for all you for, let's make a bocula reference for all you quantum leap fans you can you do that too you quantum leap all day yeah so so fun era to play in you know time travel uh is can be complicated, but I know a lot of RPG groups love stuff like that, including other dimensions and things you know that you could play with this. And finally, we get to the last era we've seen on TV. Talk to us about the 32nd century. Yeah, and this one uh, we've only got one season worth of stuff so far, but we got season two or season four coming up here pretty soon. So Discovery season three, they went into a bold new direction. They they jumped 900 years ahead in uh, in in like what we know of you know star trek canon and they went into the 3100s and uh you know the the discovery got an upgrade to a uh, 32nd uh, century technology and there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening uh the federation is still in existence but it's completely different now because it's such a a shadow of his former self and that probably ties into what you were saying about picard like how it started to kind of deconstruct the federation and like show you how 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 hard it is to maintain it and uh, you start to distrust society and you just, just distrust things. And and, the, and then like in the 32nd century, we see that it fell apart eventually. And, uh, but they're still trying to keep it together. There's like a core of Starfleet still trying to keep it together and still trying to do the the noble idealistic Star, Starfleet thing. And Discovery gets caught up in that. And so we've seen one season worth of stuff that could be really cool for this setting. And as far as I know, uh, season four will continue that in the same era. And uh, you know that's a that's an opportunity for game masters who aren't familiar with the the fifty five years of stuff behind us. You've only got one season worth of stuff to worry about, and then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to do even more stream mixing in a weird way because if you wanted to remember Dune, which is another Modiphius property and yeah. a popular movie right now, is set tens of thousands of years in the future. Uh -huh. And who's to say that? one of the offshoots of the federation that these are the what the human colonists didn't end up becoming so mm -hmm. so you can get really creative with the future and wow mix a little star trek with a little bit of dune get two <laughs> real good properties together you know you get a lot of satisfaction yeah. if your players want a variety of types of games sure that's how creative you can get with star trek adventures right yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, honestly, I mean, Star Trek, anything is possible, right? L throw a little techno babble at it and uh, anything's possible. I mean, heck, if you really wanted to, like, I don't know how this might be too extreme. Like, I think Dune plus Star Trek, Star Trek would be pretty amazing. But like, if you're into, if you're into like, uh, I don't know, like Warhammer uh, or like Warhammer 40k, I mean, sure, why not? Why not have the Federation kind of like bump heads with the Empire and <laughs> you know, it'd be it'd be crazy and wild, but uh, I mean, really seriously, you could you could pull anything into Star Trek and find a way to make it work, and it would be, you know, it'd be cool. That's the fun of that's the fun of RPG. I don't know if you saw it, but they had a um, Avengers in game YouTube thing 
where the scene where you know Doc Strange starts calling all the heroes and he starts calling all the heroes. He even called like Rambo and Sigourney <laughs> Weaver from Alien and Back to the Future and Ghostbusters. Sure. Did, you, did you see that? Yeah. It was hilarious. And I was like, oh, this is, I said, and I was like, I wish I could see this movie. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So, wow, Jim, we've only talked about half of the section of chapter three so yeah. far. It's now a lot we're, yeah, yeah. There's so much gold there. And now we're going to go to some more gold about styles of play. Okay. I have to admit, I like this chapter a little bit because I wrote a lot of it along with yeah. uh, Fred Love, um, this section. Yeah. Talk to us about the purpose of the styles of play section yeah so like if you're a game master in a group of players and you're thinking about star trek and like what what kind of a game do you want to play what kind of campaign do you want to run you got a couple overlays you need to think about like one overlay is like what polity are you are you starfleet are you the klingon empire are you the romulans like what what you know you know militaristic body are you playing right so that's one layer to think about because that's going to influence what ships you have and what you're doing and like you some some of the tone of your game next is to figure out your timeline that's a layer that you're adding on like what what era of play are you playing and we just talked about that and then next is like what style of play do you want to play because like there's so many different ways you can play the game and so this chapter is really kind of like taking i think we broke it down into eight distinct yeah, let's go over the highlights yeah yeah let's, and, let's and um, so, so this is just another overlay to think about. And the first one, I'll just jump into it here, is uh, the admir- admiralty style of play. And we talked, we touched on this in the in the command source book. And what this is is like, so sure, everybody can be you know captain and crew on one ship doing your thing, but you can take it up a level and say, you know, okay, instead of everybody playing officers on a ship, you're all playing captains, like, or maybe someone's playing an admiral. And then everyone else is playing a captain under that admiral. So instead of controlling one character, you're controlling an entire ship. And that just changes the scope of your storytelling so that instead of just talking about one ship, you're talking about maybe a whole sector of space or maybe a whole region of space where you're, you're, you, the, the scope of it has just gotten bigger t- as far as the stuff that you're responsible for. This chapter reminded me of players who maybe are big into the video gaming of Star Trek and fleets. Yeah. battles and stuff like that that this might be the level of campaign they want if they want to take risk or starfleet you know the fleet battles into the gaming thing you can mm-hmm. use the rules and still achieve it but in an rpg format i've always found video games very restricting because i have to follow the rules and that's not mm-hmm. how i live my life generally i you know i try to i try to <laughs> find new and creative ways to do things uh-huh. um, and so i feel that at an admiralty campaign you're playing the people who make the rules now and i think that's kind of cool uh with that one all right so that's one style of play before we move on i want to focus that um part of this chapter also focus on the style of campaign in the way of whether you're going to make it episodic or whether you're going to make it cinematic so maybe there's just one you know in a movie it would end up two hours but in a gaming it could be three weeks of play then mm-hmm. end up in a movie so um what did you think about that why did you want to highlight that difference for new players uh did we highlight that here or, or is that an, i think that's in a future chapter isn't it where we talk about uh i, I mean maybe it, not maybe maybe it's here too but I think yeah, both, I mean, yeah page 72 talks about it I, one of the things i noticed maybe the reason why um it was highlighted here is because it talks about casting the right villain so unlike a tv shows who are episodic and have different characters each week for a oh, cinema, yeah. you really need to cast the right villain. And I thought that was okay. a really cool idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I I got it. I I didn't catch your segue into the next style of play, but yeah. So one of the, one of the other what, the next style of play that we were, we talked about is is like looking at the movies, right? So like you take you take the and the great example is the original series, right? So they they took the original series crew, and then they translated them to the silver screen. But in the process of doing so, you have to amp everything up, right? You have to bring more action and um, drama and pathos to the story so that it's not quite so small and intimate on the, on the TV screen. It's just bigger on the, uh, on the big screen. And so we provided some guidance of, like, how do you do that? And, like, exactly what you were saying, you need a memorable villain slash antagonist to, to be really interesting. And I think... Um, you know, Khan is probably the, the single best yeah, example of that. He, he's such a bigger than life villain for, for Kirk to, to uh, you know, butt heads with. I, I, and again, I want to make the comparison. So for people who want to transfer their video gaming skills over to this, this is a better setting for the big boss. Like 
a series of events until you finally get to the big boss. If right. you want to play that kind of game where there's minor villains, minor obstacles, and then finally get to the big boss, that's more cinematic style. Mm -hmm. um, and video games are based off cinematic style many times because of that. So this is a cool style of play. You could read this chapter to get understanding about how to how to do that if you like that. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, then um, we talked about season-long story arcs. What mm -hmm. what would you compare that to if there was a TV show that you had to make a comparison for a season-long story arc? Uh, my best example would be DS9. I think uh, especially, oh, the, the first three episodes of the second season were a very tight, contained arc, uh, but then you get into the Dominion War and then like... Um, uh, the the last nine episodes of the last season were one huge long story um, it, it, that you can do. But you know, even um, uh, Discovery does this really well, mm -hmm. and Enterprise uh, season three of Enterprise uh, primarily, where, where it's all the exp the expanse and the in the um, the sphere builders and the the Zindi and all that stuff. Um, that's Let's all. Not forget to mention the Shackleton Expanse campaign guide because that <laughs> that is. A campaign story arc. Uh, you, right? I, was, I was, well, yeah. I, I was trying not to be too much of a of a of a plugger here, but yeah, absolutely. The the Shackleton Expanse campaign guide that came out not too long ago uh, well, that tells an, an epic story that could could be one season, it could be multiple seasons. But right. yeah, again, I didn't write it. I'm only plugging <laughs> it because people oftentimes want a picture of like, well, how do I build an interconnecting story with different modules and different episodes right. that end up at a certain point. That is the model of how to do it in that guide. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that would explain what a season-long story arc could look like. Mm -hmm. um, so then, what we do is we divert into the more episodic shows, which have always been my favorite. I'm the ep I love episodic. I love walking away after 42 minutes and being just gratified from beginning to ending. Wrap up the story can go anywhere in the canon. Um, and, and we started there. Um, I wrote it these chapters, so I don't know. You know, I wanted to get your take on it. Um, Talk about close to home political campaigns in core worlds. Um, how does that differentiate from other type of uh, shows that you may watch? Uh, I can't ask a question again because I'm so late. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should be asking you the question since okay, you asked me the questions. Let's flip the. Let's flip it. Go ahead. Yeah, ask flip it. So, so you, you've you never talked it. about it outside of this. Was it was it you or Fred who wrote this one? It was you, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I wrote this. I wrote, I think, this to the end of the chapter. Yep. Yeah. So, 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 what was your model for the close to home campaigns there, Michael? Sure. So that was definitely would have been the next generation. So the next generation that that means that the ship is flying within the the center of the Federation. You could be going from this planet one day to deliver supplies to a rescue mission the next day to courting an ambassador back on planet Earth in the next week. And so this was really about you're in the that clean cut. Picard level world of anything could happen. A lot of family, a lot of friends, people you used to go to the academy with, uh, Riza pleasure planets, things like that. This is this setting here, which most people are familiar with. With the next generation. Yep, and I'll I'll add um, all, all great stuff. I'll add that like for those uh, fans and gamers and players who are really familiar with uh, next gen DS9, like playing a close to home game means it's going to feel familiar, right? You're going to have all this, all the alien species that you saw on screen are going to be available to you. Like you got the, you got the Klingons, you got the Romulans, you got the Cardassians, you've got the Ferengi, like you, you got familiar guest stars that you can drop into your campaigns and into your episodes. You don't have to, like as a game master, you don't necessarily have to work real hard to create new species or new situations or new aliens. You can just like, you know, just drop them right into what what is familiar and go with it. Um, I want to add one more thing, Michael, and that's um, you can get really political with this because you are in the Alpha and, Alpha and Beta Quadrant and you're in all this familiar stuff. And again, Next Gen is a great model for that because Picard, even as clean cut as he was, he became the arbiter of succession for the Klingon Empire. And that had a huge, huge ramifications for this the, the whole franchise all the way through DS9 where, you know, Worf finally, uh, you know, killed, killed Gowron. And, right. uh, and and gave the chancellor chancellorship over to Martok, right? So that the fact that Picard was a, a key component of that is something that you could use as a model for your game group. And like if your captain wanted to do something that that monumental too, there's an opportunity to do that. There's a there's precedent for it, right? So you could because you're playing a close to home game, 
and you're able to interact with all these well-known species and 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 worlds and stuff that's just an opportunity to really to, to really uh, dig down into it yep and again it's a very also if you're playing a more humorous lighthearted game lower decks is, would be a would be right yeah. in here they're making second contact which i think is totally hilarious so after yeah. the hard work is done by by picard and his crew you, you're the cleanup <laughs> crew so again yeah. you could have a where are they now type right of mission with 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 this yeah yeah cool yeah all right are yeah. you still going to flip it on me for a while yeah sure so i think i think because i think you wrote deep space exploration missions too didn't you i did i did and again so, this, would be, this would be similar to um, Star Trek Enterprise, because mm-hmm. again, you're on your own, Jim already talked about that, or Star Trek, the original series. And these are ones. Now, one of the f- funnest parts I had writing this, Jim, was on page, it starts on page 80, and it's page 80 and 81. But I had to close my eyes and think, okay, there's nothing ahead of you. You have no support. Starfleet's behind you. And I'm just trailblazing like, like, you know, Stanley and Livingston years ago, and you don't know what you're going to hit and what's that like. And on page 80 and 81, I had so much fun talking about how sensors on a starship work as mm-hmm. you start from long range and you get closer. But what really got me, I, I really um, extrapolated close range tasks because I was like, okay, what's it like on the ship once you get into a new star system and there's four planetoids and some asteroid belts? What does everyone do? You don't see this a lot in Star Trek, but what about, you know, all the shuttles probably take off. People start saying scientists are vying for resources and shuttles and equipment and personnel. And inside that ship must be so exciting as all these scientists come back to the ship and just start studying what they find and cataloging it before they move on deeper into space. And then occasionally you end up at a star system and there's a new life form. And that just creates a whole new hub of are they sentient? Are they not? And this really um, excited me. If you're into that type of gaming, this mm-hmm. explains um, what it's like to have a deep space game. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you this then, Michael, given all of that, um, and I, I am pretty sure of the timeline, I think you wrote this chapter before you read the Shackleton Expanse campaign guide. Yes. So, so having written this and knowing what you know about deep space exploration games, how how would you apply all of this great stuff to taking the Shackleton Expanse, which is literally a deep space exploration game, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that is that is it to a T. So, like, tell me a little bit, like, how in your game master brain, because I know you've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I, I just want you to share it with the audience. Like, like, yeah. how would you take these concepts that you've wrote in the game master guide and apply it to running something like the Shackleton Expanse? Sure. So I, right away, when you asked me that question, the first thing I envisioned is from the Shackleton Expanse Guide, the map that was done. There was a map of the Shackleton Expanse. And right away, I thought, OK, my crew's out there by themselves. Where are they starting? What direction are they heading? And what are they hitting on the way there? And, and that's where then, as we go in those directions, we see different planetary bodies, different star systems. I then take those modules from the Sackleton Expanse and say, okay, this is when they're meeting them. This is when they're meeting them. And I kind of lay it out mentally like that. Mm-hmm. And so you could do that. Um, you could pick any of the modules um, or if you're creating your own stories, get a star map. Go get, um, you know, I have that star map from Star Trek over here with, mm-hmm. with the whole galaxy and there's areas of unexplored. And it's so fun when you get with your players and you lay it out and say, what direction do you want to go in? And then, and then you just in, take all the modules, the ones produced from modifius.net or mission briefs, and just lay them out. And that's what they're going to discover. Some people even, um, I've seen some game masters give a grid of the star system, and they yeah. let the play, they, they plant the adventures. They don't tell them what they are. And depending on the player's random selection of where to go, that's the adventure they're going to end up playing. And I think nice. that's kind of cool, too. That emulates that, that uh, deep space exploration feel. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. All right. So then, um, I, you know, and, and just continue the, the theme here. I, I think you wrote Far From Home, right? That's the next. Nice did. Yeah. So, so, let, so tell us about what's your model here for Far From Home games. Near and dear to my heart. This is Star Trek Voyager. This mm-hmm. is this is you thought you had backup and now you're on your own. And now you have to make ethical choices about the kind of people you and your crew are. Are you stick? You no longer have the Federation's protection or backing. Are you still a believer in the prime directive or are you going to go rogue? And this one is the most tragic one. This this one breaks my heart because Mm -hmm. um, 
like we saw in Star Trek Voyager, you get down to the raw of each and every human on that crew, or not human, excuse me, each and every creature on that crew. Um, and I talked about there's different types of getting lost and far from home. You can be lost in space, lost in time, or put into other realities like we saw in Star Trek Discovery, the mirror universe. And, and I, I think my favorite thing about, again, the far from home games is it really calls in the ethics, morality, and belief systems of a crew. Mm -hmm. This is tough. It's a really tough place to be. And my game, my the game that I play, we're actually 13.7 million light years away in the Centaurus A galaxy. So I said, I'm pushing it even further. I'm taking it to another galaxy. And I have to say, it's been the most rewarding GMing experience of my life. And the players, I, I'm blessed with some of the best players now. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just give you an anecdote. When I was reading the manuscript that you sent in for this, I, I, I really, I was really touched by this chapter or this section of the chapter um, because um I, I, uh, I didn't love Voyager, and that was only because I, I thought it was a great concept that the the episodic format of television at the time didn't do it justice because they the ship was pristine and new literally every episode, yeah. and I was like, how could this possibly? I wanted it to be more like uh, Battlestar Galactica, where you see the wear and tear episode after episode, you see the people getting worn down by this journey. And it was just like, oh no, we're Starfleet. It's everything's copacetic week after week after week. But there was a section in this chapter that you wrote that that made me think twice about it. And I was like, wow, you are literally, you know, in the case of Voyager, 70,000 light years away from home. It's going to take you a generation to get back home uh, under normal circumstances. And so like, how does that mean for your crew? Like the, does your captain rule with an iron fist and force you to stay in the Starfleet ideals? Do you become a generational ship? Do you, uh, um, you know, do you, what do you think about the prime directive? Like, do you just throw it to the wind and just like do your own thing? Like you, you asked, you asked some great questions in this thing that like as a game master, I was like, oh, maybe I should think about playing a far from home game where, where like everything is on the, everything is off the table and you can do whatever the heck you want. And then like, and leave it up to the crew and the players to be like, do you want to stay Starfleet? Or do you want to just go rogue and be like independence taking full advantage of the resources at your disposal? Like, yeah, there's just so many questions here that you can answer. Well, and like you said, that's one of the reasons I fell in with Janeway. Because it was episodic in nature, you could never get really deep into her character. They had limited yeah. time every week. But the kind of person she had to be, which we now know from Star Trek Prodigy, she's one of the most decorated Starfleet captains. Yeah. The kind of person you need to be to get through that, I there's other popular captains that I honestly don't think would have made the same decisions and stuck with Starfleet. Kirk would never have done it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kirk would have, uh, no, he would have colonized the planet or something. But uh, yeah, I, that's why this was my, definitely in both the Game Master's Guide and the Player's Guide, this is my favorite piece to write. Nice. Nice. All right. So let's move on to the to the next one here. Uh, Spice of Life games. Talk, talk to us about Spice of Life. Sure. So Spice of Life is, is not too different um, from playing within the Federation area. Actually, you know, what? I'm going to correct myself just in case I'm wrong. You know, the close to home political campaigns and core worlds. I just got it mixed up. I think that was Fred who wrote that. And I just talked about it. So I love giving credit where credit's due. Uh, that's fair. Factions and politics. So he, I think, wrote the part on factions and politics, which I confuse with Spice of Life games because it's everything I already said. People okay. Close, people you know, that's what that was. So I'm not going to repeat myself. And sorry about that, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he'll forgive us. And he wrote the next part too, just so we know. So let's talk about station-based games. I'll go ahead and take the, the questioning back. So what's the big difference between being in a ship and being in a station, Jim? Yeah, and you know this is uh, this this harkens uh, again. DS Nine is my favorite series by far. I got the T shirt on today, of course. Uh, it, it was a, it was such a a different approach to Star Trek storytelling. So like instead of the ship going off to a new planet, dealing with the planet, and then you know warping away at the end, and you're like, oh, whatever problems we had to deal with, they got left behind. We'll never see them again. You know, episode of the week, right? But for DS Nine, it's like, wait a minute, your problems don't go away. They're still there. Right, you you're still living with these people, right? Like the 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 problem, the adventure comes to you, and so like you know, Cisco and you think of all the characters on uh, on DS Nine, like they had the same things 
I mean, not the, they were faced, they had to make decisions. And then those decisions had repercussions week after week after week because they couldn't escape it, right? They couldn't, I mean, not that they Gilligan, couldn't. Go. It was Gilligan's Island, man. It yeah. was Fantasy Island. It was Love Boat. Yeah, it was, or or it was, a you know, instead of a Wagon Train to the Stars you know, for Star Trek, this was, uh, you know, uh, you're you're in a western town and like you just live there and it's like Deadwood, right? It, it, it's uh, people are coming into the town and you're dealing with it. You're the marshal or you're the doctor or you're the constable or whatever, and you you're just dealing with all these new faces that show up week after week, and uh, and then the 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 choices that you make have have consequences, right? And it, it changes the 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 feel of the town, right? Like uh, you know, a, a key character dies and then everyone's got to deal with that rep- the repercussions of that. You just can't escape it. And it's it just it is a great way to tell Star Trek stories from a different perspective, right? And uh um I always say yeah. it, this is a good time to mention that remember, you don't have to dedicate your group to playing just one of these types before you get right. to the very last piece. Um you could all of a sudden dock your people at a space station for a retrofit for three to four yeah. months of game time and see how they deal with that, you know, and, and station games also applies to being stuck in a colony on a planet or a mining asteroid, right? It can be flexible to all that. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the station doesn't have to be in space, right? Like uh, right. Um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the Star Trek campaigns I ran ages ago um, my my co GM and I wanted to do something different. We wanted to really shake it up, and of course we were both inspired by DS Nine. And we were like, well, how about we set, how about we do a, a Star Trek game based on a planet, right? So why don't we create a station like a like a like a scientific outpost that's on a planet, and the planet itself has a whole bunch of interesting, crazy stuff going on, in addition to all the other things that are happening in orbit or in or in the sector or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was different because it was like it wasn't. Um, DS9, right? It was something right. a little different on the planet. And we got to get like the weather. There was like w- weird weather things that were happening and there were weird alien creatures on the planet that we got mm-hmm. to get involved with. And it was just okay. a fun, it was just a fun different way to tell Star Trek stories in a different um, environment than we were used to seeing on screen. So it's a, it's just an opportunity to do something different. Yeah. Back in the day, my, back in the day, me and my dad, when we were watching DS9, dreamed that somehow Deep Space Nine would end up in the wormhole and that would be where the station ends up in the show. We dreamt about that. That would have been so cool. Nice. (laughs) All right, cool. Finally, the last piece I did write, this last section I I did write. Yep, so unsanctioned missions. Talk to us about, I I can guess where you're going with this, but tell me all about what your thoughts are on uh, running a uh, unsanctioned mission type of uh, story time. Well, you know, I wrote it in the first intro paragraph. I'll just read it. The crew of the Enterprise (laughs) led by James Kirk defies Starfleet orders, busts out of space dock and returns to the Genesis planet to rescue Spock. Or Worf resigns his Starfleet commission to join the Klingon Defense Force. Or Jean-Luc Picard assembles a ragtag band to unravel the mystery of the Jat Vash. So these are all the rule breakers. Or um, maybe it's people who never joined Starfleet because they don't believe in the mission and they're running vigilante runs. Maybe they're the drug runners. If you want to play that kind of game, maybe they have illegal tech. Maybe they're out there, you know, mad at the bureaucracy because it moves too slow and they got some people, powerful connections and they can blow stuff up too. And and always run under, run under the radar. So I really wrote this inspired by Picard. That's for sure. Um, I'm also happy to see that this could also be included with like Star Trek prodigy. Mm-hmm. because they're not Starfleet. We don't know what they're going to do with yep. that. But this is really for the players, too, who just want to be like, forget it. I'm doing what I want to do. I have a bunch of hand solo types, sorry to borrow from another franchise, who mm-hmm. want to who want to uh, play a game, pew, pew, kind of game. That's mm-hmm. what I wrote that for. Yep. And I'd, I would add that you could also easily, easily do a, a Maquis type of campaign in this uh, in this uh, kind of milieu. Um, and then I guess as long as we're shamelessly plugging other products, I, I, I wanna make sure that folks know that like the player's guide um, it, it is really gonna, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to you know sensationalize it, but I think the player's guide, the content of the player's guide is gonna blow the doors off of what you can do in Star Trek Adventures, simply by the fact that we're adding character roles for Non Starfleet, non non Klingon species. So, like, if you wanted to play a, um, any type of um, character that goes into that that Han Solo um, spirit, 
or a um or a or even like what we see on ds9 and voyager where you've got uh bajoran militia and unaligned militia and you've got a tailor you've got a, a bartender you've got uh religious figures you've got uh you know neelix a uh, independent merchant independent trader whatever all these different character types that you see on star trek that are not starfleet or not klingon um you can create a rag that ragtag group of misfits like a civilian doctor like or you know whatever yeah, and they need <laughs> and to put them together yeah and they need a motivation so when yeah. i remember when i was writing this chapter i was like well, what's going to motivate someone to leave the creature comforts of the federation right. to go and go live on the outskirts the fringes and so um some of the things i put maybe you know someone you owe someone a debt you're a vigilante. I mentioned some of the illegal activities you may be part of, or maybe it's espionage. Maybe you are Federation, but they've tucked you away to break down like a criminal ring or something. Maybe you're working for Section 31. And then then I ended up thinking like, okay, you're on your own. Where do you get resources from? And so there's guidance about you better establish some context, tax. You better figure out how to get some starships if you don't own one. And then weapons and technology would be a huge part. So I put some guidance in there so you could build the campaign and maybe make it logical of how you're working in this huge universe. You know? Yeah. 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 That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. And I think when I was reading your section here, because uh, I was I was at it, I was editing the uh, the players guide at the same time. Um, I was just really excited at, at seeing this, the, you know, the unsanctioned missions concept coupled with all the new player options we were providing in the player's guide and and just imagining like what is the 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 star trek adventures game you know core out there in the world going to do with this once they get their hands on it because like literally if somebody wanted to do like um uh firefly in the star trek setting or you know i mean really traveler or or, i mean any any science fiction property out there if you wanted to adapt that and put it into the star trek setting you have the tools to do it now, which is so cool. I can't wait to see what people do I, with it. I mean, I would love to see people, you you know, we talk about session zero. Imagine if people's session zero was an entire season where they are ragtag until they get brought mm-hmm. into Starfleet for some impetus. And now you're, you have yeah. a Maquis kind of view back onto Voyager, you know? So, so there's a lot of ways you could, you could really, I mean, me and you were writers. We could piece out every type and make an epic, you know, TV show. And and yeah. again, that was the point as we as we were talking about chapter three, eras of play. What time do you want your people in, or all over time? And styles of play. There's a wealth of information in these two chapters. I, I think this is probably going to be one of my or two sections. I think this is probably one of my favorite chapters to share with people too when yeah. I'm introducing them to the game. Yeah. All right, cool. So, all right. So that's where we are, Jim. Remind people if they have questions, how to get in contact with you and where they can find the products that they want to start playing Star Trek Adventures today. Yeah, sure thing. So if you want to check out any of these products, uh, head over to Medifius.net or Medifius.us, depending on where you are in the world. Um, of course, you know, buy from your friendly local game store. Uh, Medifius respects the brick and mortars program. So no matter where you buy the physical products, uh, reach out to support and Medifius and they'll get you hooked up with the PDFs of all the pro- of the physical products for free. Uh, you can reach me at email at jim at Medifius.com or you can find me on social media for this game everywhere. Uh, Twitter, Reddit, um, uh, Discord, Facebook groups, whatever. I'm not hard to find. Uh, especially if you're into Star Trek Adventures, you can find me, uh, send me questions and we'll answer the questions here on the show uh, if we can. And uh, if not, uh, we'll try to you know answer them one way or another. But uh, that's uh, that's where to reach me. And uh, Michael, how about you? Where, where can they find you? Uh, I'm on Continuing Missions, of course. Uh, you can find me there, but I'm also on the Facebook, Reddit, Discord groups. Um, my code name is Game Masters usually or Michael Dismute. Just look for that. You'll find me there. Always happy to talk Star Trek adventures. Um, did we want to plug your favorite game shop? I'm well, you know, my favorite game store uh closed about six years ago. So uh pour one out for the game parlor in Chantilly, Virginia. They were my favorite place for years and years and years. Uh I, I just by virtue of where I am right now, I don't <laughs> I don't have a, a local game store, uh friendly or otherwise. So uh, I do most right. of my game. I do most of my game ordering online now, so uh, I, you know, I'll be uh, looking for one, but uh, uh, you know, All hope right. springs eternal that a new one opens up someday. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and um, post on Facebook for people to shout out their latest uh, game shops in future episodes so that we yeah. can give love to the brick and mortar. 
that have been supporting RPGs for decades. Absolutely. All right, Jim, another awesome continuing conversations. We'll see you next time when we talk about chapter four of the Game Master's Guide, which focuses on uh, society, oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, society, technology, and service protocols. Wait. No, that's chapter, we did that one. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna do an edit real quick. Hold on one that's second. That's chapter two. Give me a pause. We're doing chapter four next. Give me a pause so I can edit. So Jim, thank you so much. Another excellent episode of Continuing Conversations. Uh, we'll talk to you all when we cover the chapter uh, about To Boldly Go. It's chapter four. It's about how to prepare for your game, recruit a crew, your first voyage, and how to run the game. This is a special for Game Masters. See you then.